So today the topic that we're talking about is they told their story. And we're in a series that we're continuing and it's the Acts of the Apostles. So if you go to the book of Acts in the Bible, it's a linking book from Jesus's ministry to the church. It's that book that stands in the middle that says, all right, how did Jesus, when he left, how did he leave his ministry? And what did they do with that? And so as we are going through this series, we're looking and seeing the things that they did and saying, all right, are we going to do that too? So today we're talking about they told their story. Last week, we, we, uh, we talked through chapter 20 of the book of Acts and how they didn't dilute the message. And I just kind of want to begin there today because it's, such, it's just such important information. I don't want to just, you know, go over it. So at the end of this chapter of chapter 20, Paul is telling the brothers and sisters in Christ. And I want you to grab onto the emotion that's in this book. And he's telling them that how he's going to go to Jerusalem, he's going to be persecuted in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit keeps telling him over and over, you're going to face persecution when you go to Jerusalem. And more than that, the people around him are telling him, the Holy Spirit is telling them this too. And, and he's telling them this is the last time they're ever going to see him. And so there's this very emotional thing happening. He's giving these people the final instructions. These are brothers and sisters in Christ. He's giving them final instructions and he's telling them, hey, whatever happens, don't dilute the message. Keep the message straight. Keep it clear. Keep it concise. This is what Jesus set forth. Keep it good. All right. And he's telling them with passion, don't do this. And then he reminds them, I'm going to leave. And this is the last time that you're going to see me. And when Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all Look at this. They all wept as they embraced and kissed him. They knew this was the last time we're going to see this guy. We're going to miss him. He's been a, such a huge influence in God's kingdom and in the church. God has used this man to touch the world. They wept and they embraced him and they kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. So they walked with him down to the ship. And look at what this next verse says. And, I, and, and this is, I mean, if, if you could put this into a movie, you'd be crying, right? After we had torn ourselves away, that's fairly dramatic, isn't it? After we had torn ourselves away. So Dr. Luke is with him and this is firsthand information. He saw it. He wrote this and he said, after we tore ourselves away from them, we put out to sea and we sailed straight to Kos, which is a Greek island. Now, this part of the story reads so interestingly because you have God telling Paul, the Holy Spirit telling Paul, when you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be persecuted. And you've got the rest of these people, Christian brothers and sisters, are telling Paul not to go. And Paul was hearing from the Holy Spirit that he had to go even though he was going to be persecuted. Why would God be telling him, you're going to be persecuted when you go here, and at the same time telling the brothers and sisters in Christ to tell him, you're going to be persecuted if you go there? Is the Holy Spirit telling him not to go? Not at all. The Holy Spirit was urging him and telling him, you need to go to Jerusalem. The day of Pentecost was the deadline. I want you there by then. Then why was God telling the people to tell him that he's going to be persecuted? Here's why. Because God wanted them and he wanted Paul to understand that when he's going through whatever he's going to be facing, God knew about it, God planned it, and it's going to be okay. And how many of you know that's encouraging when you're going through a very difficult time? If you know God is with you, you're okay. Amen. No matter how difficult it is. So while they're there... Well, he goes, he, so they take off in the ship and they go to a place called Caesarea. And there he goes to a place, uh, a, a house of Philip. He's an evangelist. And Philip has four daughters and they just happen to be prophets themselves, prophetesses. And so these girls, that doesn't say what they told him, but how many of you know what they told him? They told him, when you go to Jerusalem... It's going to be painful. It's going to be brutal. It's going to be difficult. They prophesied to him. And then this other guy comes all the way down from Judea. His name is Agabus. And Agabus comes in. And this reads like, like this scene in a movie. I would love to see this put in a movie. It's pretty fun. 
He comes in, and look what, what Luke wrote. Dr. Luke was there. He saw this firsthand information. He's, he's a witness, right? He says, coming over to us, he took Paul's belt out of, uh, away from him, and he tied his own hands and feet with it and said, the Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. So, Paul knew what was going to happen. But bigger than that, Paul knew that God was going to be with him while he was going through it. And that's what all of this was about, all of the prophecy. And they wept and they pled with him like a mother pleading with her child not to go and do something stupid. They were pleading with Paul, don't leave, don't go. We're this, we don't want this to happen to you. And Paul said, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm not only ready to be bound, but also die in Jerusalem for the name of our Lord Jesus. Wow, that's powerful. And when he would not be dissuaded, we, Dr. Luke says, we, I tried to dissuade him as well. Luke that wrote, Matthew, Mark, Luke, one of the Gospels, the same guy, he wrote Acts. We gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. So these people understood that it was the Lord's will that he goes to Jerusalem and he faces persecution and possibly and, and death at some point. So they went to Jerusalem. They took off on the ship and they warmly welcomed. And this is really cool. When they got to Jerusalem, think about who's in Jerusalem. The apostles, the, the, original, the originals, right? The ones that were with Jesus. And these guys are in Jerusalem. And so they come out and some of the other people from the church, they come out and they greet him, warmly welcomed him. And Paul and, had told them story after story. If you read it, he just went into story after story about what God was doing all over Asia and all over Europe now. And how God had used this ministry to just spread all over the place. And, and they praised God together, it says. And the local brothers then... They sat down, and I can see it, you know, they sit down for coffee, and they're like, all right, Paul, we've got, we've got some things, we need to do some business here. We've got thousands of Jews that have come to Jesus, but they've yet to become mature in Christ yet. And so, Paul, you know what that means? It means they're still following the law in so many ways. They're still living under the old covenant, and they've not matured out of all of that. Not that we're throwing away the law. You guys understand that. We've fulfilled the law with what? Love. Jesus fulfilled the law with love, right? And so understanding that these people, the new Christians, the new believers that were Jews, that were under Judaism, are still living under that. And so, Paul, you got to understand, we're, we're dealing with that. And, and here's what you need to know, Paul. These people have heard stories about you that, that they're concerned about. They don't know what it looks like to live completely free the way that you live and the way that you're telling all the Gentiles to live in this uh, in, under Jesus and the way Jesus taught. They're just not mature yet. So here's what we need you to do, Paul. We have four new members of the church that are going to be well, they're, they're Jewish people and they're going to be, serum, well, I'm sorry, they're, they're not Jewish people. These are, these are Greeks that are coming into the church and, and they need to be ceremonial cleansed because the Jews are requiring this of us, all right? And so they're like, just play along with us. This is what's going to happen. We need, and if this is going to happen, we need you to, to actually, we need you to pay for it for them so that you can... You can be a part of this and these people not refute you. And Paul's like, what? Pay for it. And it, well, we've got one more thing, Paul, that we need you to do. And th these guys are going to have to shave their heads and we need you to pay for their barber shop. Is that all right? And so one more thing, Paul, you're going to have to get your head shaved too. And you're going to have to go through all of this as well. What? I need to shave bald? Seriously? On purpose? <laughs> I'm going to be made bald on purpose? Not accidentally like some people? <laughs> and so the great Apostle Paul, to accommodate for the new believers, the immature, he lets them shave his head. And he is bald. And beautiful. 
And he pays for these other guys to get shaved. He pays for these other guys to go through the ceremonial cleansing. It was a seven-day process. And after seven days, Paul finds out he's shaved his head. He's done all of this cleansing stuff. And he finds out it was all absolutely useless. Because he goes into the, this, the, uh, the temple. And look what, it, look what it says. There were some Jews from Ephesus that grabbed him and they went nuts. It says they grabbed Paul and started yelling at the top of their lungs. Help you Israelites, help us. So dramatic, right? This is the man who is going all over the world telling lies against us and our religion and this place. He's even brought Greeks in here and defiled this holy place. And then it explains what they're talking about because Paul was innocent. He hadn't done any of this. And it says what had happened was they had seen Paul and this Greek Trophimus, the Ephesian, walking together in the city. And they assumed that he was just this bad person that would bring him into the temple and defile the temple. And they accused him of something he never did. Isn't that ridiculous? Thank you. It says that the whole city was in an uproar and everybody started running towards where the temple was and, it, and people were rubbernecking. They're like, what's going on? Who's in trouble? What's happening? We haven't seen this kind of excitement at the temple for a while. And everybody starts running to see what's going on. And, 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 and they, what happened was they dragged Paul out of the temple and they locked the temple behind him. Why? Because they didn't want him to run back in. Because in those days, if you went, if you were being chased by the, the law, if you were a fugitive, if you were someone being pursued, you could run into the temple and you could grab on the horns of the altar and nobody could touch you. It was a place of safety. It was a place of refuge, a place of asylum. And you were able to stand there and hold the horns of the altar and nobody could touch you. And they didn't want that to happen. So they locked the temple down. And Paul has been dragged out into the streets, down the steps of the, of the temple. And they're beating on him. And it says they're trying to kill him. That's a bad day at church. And the Roman captain of the guard heard what was happening. So he hurried their way. He, he mustered some troops. And the mob saw him coming. And they were like, whoa. And they quit beating Paul and they were like, mm, he was like that when he got here. I don't. He arrested Paul and he asked the crowd what he had done. He was like, hey, what, what are you guys mad about? What did this guy do, do to you guys? And the charges were so off the chart. They just, everybody was saying a different thing. The guy didn't know what to do with it. He was, so they took him back. They were going to take him back to the military barracks there. And they began as they began heading this way, and this gives you an indication of how emotional and crazy these people were, the steps of the temple were kind of on the way to go to where the barracks were. And as they headed that way, it says, Paul approached the steps of the temple and the people started just going berserk like they thought he was going to go up into the temple anyway. And they started yelling, kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him. So. They kept going and they were like, oh, never mind. He was just going. <laughs> the crowd followed him to the, tent, to the barracks. And when they got to the steps to go in, Paul said to the captain, in the captain's language, can I say something to you? And the captain said, oh, you speak Greek. Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. I thought you were the Egyptian who not long ago started a riot here and then hid out in the desert with his 4,000 thugs. He was like, I thought, the, I thought the Jews had a real complaint here. I thought you were a really bad person. You're not the Egyptian we've been looking for. And Paul said, no, I'm a Jew born in Tarsus and I'm a citizen still of that influential city. I have a simple request, though. Let me speak to the crowd. Standing on the barracks steps, Paul turned and held his arms up. A hush fell over the crowd as Paul began to speak. and He spoke Hebrew. And Paul began to tell his story. He started with this. My dear brothers and fathers. Listen carefully to what I have to say before you jump to conclusions about me. 
And when they heard him speaking Hebrew, the, cr- the crowd even got quieter. No one wanted to miss a word of this. He, com- he continued, and he started with this. I'm a good Jew. That's a great start, right? And then Paul told him where he was born, told him that he was trained under Gamaliel, who was a great, great, deep trainer in the law in the day. And he says, I was just as zealous for God as you were, as you are right now, today. And he told them, he said, I persecuted Christians. I threw Christians in jail. Whether they were male or female, I threw them in jail. I killed Christians. I did what you're doing now. I was doing what you're doing right now. In fact, I was in charge of it. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And he, and he told them the details then of, of how he got saved. And he started telling them his story of how he met Jesus. And all the way back in Acts chapter 9, you can see it's the same story that we've talked about before. And, and here we, we have, though, Luke recording the first-hand account of Paul telling his experience. Paul told them his story, and I want to read it to you. In verse 6, he said, it was about noon. How many of you remember about what time it was when you first got saved? He says, it was about noon, and I came near Damascus. Suddenly, a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, that was his name at the time, why do you persecute me? And he said, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. He replied, my companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told that you have an, what you have been assigned to do, all that you've been assigned to do. My companions led me by hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and a highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, brother Saul, receive your sight. At that very moment, I was able to see again. So the people were listening intently to the stories. They're like, man, okay, so this Jesus came, knocked him off his donkey, talked to him, spoke to him, blinded him, then healed him, gave him information, told him what to do. All right, this is interesting. But Paul then got to a part in the story that the crowd did not like. How many of you know that something about your story may not be liked by everybody that you're telling it to? In fact, if they're like this crowd, they might be standing there listening to you tell your story, waiting for you to say that one thing that causes them to go, nope. Don't believe. And some of you have had that experience before because people, when they, when they don't want to believe, they're going to be listening for that one thing, right? And so that's what happened. And Paul gave it to him. Paul told them that one day he said, all right, so the next part of this says, I came to Jerusalem. Remember the, the temple that you guys just dragged me out of and beat the tar out of me? That temple, I was praying in that temple one day. And suddenly I went into a trance and I heard God speak. And he said this, quick. Leave Jerusalem immediately because the people are here will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, these people know that I, I went from synagogue to, to another to imprison and beat from one synagogue to another to, and, and to pri- in prison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, and that was Acts chapter 7, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, basically, yeah, you're right. Go, I will send you to the Gentiles. And when they heard that he was being sent by God to the Gentiles, the place went nuts again. Why? Because they hate the Gentiles and they only want God to have favor on them. They hated that he even said that. They couldn't believe that God would want the Gentiles to be saved. So to appease the crowd, the captain of the guard ordered him to be beaten, flogged. And Paul goes, whoa. Wait a second. I'm a Roman citizen. What? You just told us you were from Tars. What? You're a Roman citizen? Oh, man. And we've got this guy in chains. 
He hasn't even been tried and we've got him in chains and we were going to beat him. This is a problem. He was experiencing the same kind of injustice and miscarriage of justice that Jesus experienced in Jerusalem. And the Roman official didn't know what to do with him, so he called, he called the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders, and the high priests, and all of the Jewish people, because he's, he's like, we're Romans, we don't know what to do with this, this guy hasn't broken any of our laws, it's just causing a disruption in the town, we've got to deal with this. So he called all the religious leaders together, and, and they brought Paul in, and, and Paul is like, all right, I know how to deal with this situation. Because we had two different sects of the Jews there. One was the Sadducees, a group of Jews, right? There's the Jewish leaders that are the Sadducees. And the Sadducees were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in anything happening after death. They believed that when you die, that's it. And that was a sect within Judaism. The Pharisees, on the other hand, believed in life after death, believed in the resurrection, believed that the Messiah would come at some point and all of that, and he would be raised from the dead. And, and they believed all of that, but they were prideful. And it was all about the law. And so we had problems with both of these sects. And so Paul is like, all right, I know how to handle this situation. And look what he said. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. The place went nuts. There is no resurrection of the dead. Yes, there is. There is no resurrection of the dead. Yes, there is. And the assembly was divided. The Romans had to send out the troops again, and they took Paul back into the barracks, not knowing what to do with him. All right, so... And I love this. I love this. This is so awesome. And if you, if you walk away with anything today, I want you to remember this one statement. The following night, the Lord stood near him. Paul was in prison. And the Lord stood near him. And just let... Let that visual come to you. God himself came and stood near him in prison. And he said, Paul, take courage. He said, that story, as you testified about me yesterday in Jerusalem, that story, I want you to go tell it in Rome. I like that story. Man, that was a great story. When you talked about how you and I met, remember when I knocked you off the donkey? That was awesome. You were like, hey, who are you, Lord? And I'm like, I'm Jesus. I'm your that was hysterical. You should have seen the look on your face. You were blind and it was hilarious. It was a great story. And I want you to go tell that story in Rome. It's such a good one. You see, God heard the story Paul told and he was like, I love that story. And I. I'm sure that he loves the story that you and him have. You know, one of my favorite things to do when I'm counseling with couples is to hear their story about how they met. And some of you, I mean, I just, the look on people's faces while they're telling me those stories of how they met, some of them still can't believe how they met. And some of them are hysterical, you know, some of them are, are uh, grandmas brought them together. Some of them, they met in a place they shouldn't have met. Some of you some of, some of them met because of, you know, the internet or whatever. There's all the stories. And, and when you sit and listen to them talk about how they met, their faces just beam because they remember that first moment of 
when they laid eyes on each other and they, they remember those moments like it mattered. And, and that's in so many ways what this was like with God. God is, God is like, would you remember that moment when you finally accepted me into your life? God loves how you came to Christ. God loves how Christ came to you. God loves the intricate details of what it took for you to find salvation or to be given salvation. The details that led up to that moment that finally you were in a church service or you were on the phone with a friend or you were at work and someone shared Christ with you and you finally came to that moment. The details of what it took. And Some of you it took the death of somebody and some of you it took the birth of somebody. Somebody, some, you know, the various things that it takes for you, took for you to get down to that one place in time where you finally said, God, would you come into my life? I accept that relationship with you. And Paul's story was all the way from when and where he was born to when he was born again. And his story was beyond that. This is what, this is what God wanted me to do with this relationship for the rest of my life. And Paul's life was completely changed because Jesus came in inside of him. And, and, and so I ask you, when, when were you born again? What were your parents like growing up? What was your teenage years? What were your teenage years like? What was life like before you accepted Christ? And what led to that moment? And what was, what, who was involved in it? Who shared Christ with you? And how did Jesus find you. And Paul told of how Jesus introduced himself to him. And then what happened after you came to Christ? What happened after you came to Christ? What have you done with it? Did you listen and hear what God wanted you to do with your salvation? Did he give you direction? Did you look and see this is what God loves to do and I want to do what God loves to do and spend the rest of your life doing that? You see, the rest of Paul's life became about Jesus, the rest of it. But it wasn't just Paul. It was all the believers. All the believers. The rest of their life became all about Jesus. Their work, their play, every part of their life, every part of their day became all about Jesus. Jesus, that's who they were. And God loved Paul's story so much that he wanted Paul to go tell it in Rome. And God loves your story so much. Have you told it? Have you remembered it? So I want to switch gears and just kind of spend the rest of this um, sermon for a few minutes telling you about the people after Paul. Something that happened 45 years later. James David, would you come? We have historical record letters that were written from a Roman governor in Asia Minor, which is Turkey today. Uh, this, this guy was the governor of Bithynia. And we have a letter... We have letters written from this governor to the emperor of Rome. His name was Trajan. About 45 years after Paul was arrested in Jerusalem. And the writer of the letter, his name was Pliny. He was called Pliny the Younger because his uncle's name was also Pliny. And they needed to know the difference between Uncle Pliny and <laughs> Pliny Jr. basically. Pliny the Younger. So they called him Pliny the Younger, and Pliny the Younger became, he was, he was a lawyer. He started out as a lawyer and, and, and grew, and now he's the governor of Bithynia there in Turkey. And he wrote this letter around AD 111 is, is what the date is. And to this day, Trajan is known as one of the top two emperors ever in Rome, and there's landmarks to this day that have his name for it. it this one is uh, it's a 125 foot marble structure and it's called Trajan's Column it's there you can go see it this is a real guy this is, these are real letters written to this guy and he responded to him and this 
this column was built like five years before this letter is, is dated, AD 106. This is called Trajan's Marketplace or Tra Trajan's Market. Uh, these, these landmarks are in existence. You can go see them to this day. And so I want to read some of this letter to you. And, and before I do, I want to just kind of introduce it a little bit more. You see, Tra or, uh, Pliny wrote this letter to Trajan because he needed some direction. And what had happened was he had heard some things about the Christians that weren't, that weren't true. He had heard that the Romans felt like the Christians were bad people. And so he, he thought, man, these people are bad. we got to deal with them. And there was a rumor that the Christians would eat their children's flesh and drink their children's blood. The Christians would do that. How many of you know that's not true? And how many of you know where that came from? Communion. It's called misunderstanding. Amen? <laughs> so they were told the Christians were a problem and someone had anonymously posted the list of Christians' names in the city and exposed who all the Christians were. And so now Pliny is like, oh my goodness, I've never dealt with this group of people before. I've practiced law, but I've never dealt with them. I don't know how to deal with it. Now we've got a bunch of these people in our city that I've got to find a way to tell them to judge, our judges to judge them and what to do with them. And, and he's like, well, I don't know what to do with them. And so Pliny's letter has three main questions. He says to Trajan, he says, should any distinction be made based upon age of the Christian? Should we distinguish between children and adults? I mean, are we going to treat them all the same? And he says, uh, does denying being a Christian, does that mean that we pardon them? Because there are people that are denying Christianity and they're starting to worship the Roman God. So if that's the case, then we'll pardon them, right? Is that okay? And then he says, and then is the name of Christianity, if someone bears the name of Christianity, is that enough to kill them for? So he writes these questions and, and he wants to judge rightly, but he's actually confused. And he tells Trajan, this is how I've been dealing with it. I've actually been just killing these people. And I don't really agree with it. I don't think it's a good thing. And, and, and he doesn't say it in those words, but he says, I just need to know what, you need to hear what I've done. And he says, I've, I've investigated it. I went and I pulled two of their women, two leaders from the church. They were, they were deaconesses in the church, which is interesting. He says, I pulled these two women out and I tortured them and I got information from them, extracted information from them. But here's, here's all that I could find. And I'll quote, he said, I found nothing but depraved, excessive superstition. The Christians believe depraved, excessive superstition. What do you think he's talking about? resurrection of Jesus they keep talking about some guy that was raised from the dead after he'd been beaten and hung on a cross depraved excessive superstition and so he writes this letter and he's questioning why are we killing these Christians he's investigated them and found out they're not breaking our laws in fact in fact if I do kill all of these people that are, their names are on this list. If I kill all of these people, we're going to be killing the best in our community. So let me read it to you. He says, the sum and substance of their fault or error. He says, I, I'm winding it down here for you. The sum and substance, the bottom line, what they have done wrong is this. They were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn. What day would that be? Sunday. And these Christians met before dawn. You guys are lucky. And it wasn't because that's when the pastor decided to have the service. It was to save their lives. And look what they did while they were meeting. They would sing responsively. 
kind of like you guys did this morning. A hymn to Christ as to God and to bind themselves by oath. Not to some crime, but not to commit fraud, theft, or adultery. Not to falsify their trust, nor to refuse to return a trust when called upon to do so. And when this was over, after they had this kind of a service and meeting with the singing and binding themselves by oath to live good lives, to be healthy and strong and good people in our community and kind and good people. He says, after it was over, it was their custom to depart and assemble again to go eat some chicken. To go partake food, and look what he says, but ordinary and innocent food. <laughs> They're not eating their children and drinking their children's blood. <laughs> to kill these people would be killing the best in our community. Why are we doing this? It's a good question, isn't it? And Trajan wrote back, he said, leave them alone. Unless there are specific charges, leave them alone. Besides, prosecuting them based on an anonymous letter posted in the city would be bad precedence. Let's not do that. So two things today that I hope that you'll walk away with. One, you need a response to people of why you have hope in Jesus. And that's your story. It's your story. How did you come to Jesus? What happened that you brought him to you? What happened in your life that brought him to you? How did you come to know him? How did he come to you? Have you thought about your story? And let me tell you this, you need to live a life that shows that you truly do believe it. Because that's what these believers did. 45 years later, we have an external, outside of the Bible letter that says, these people lived like they believed. Live it. But you also need to know that when you start telling your story to somebody, I have... I have a sneaky suspicion that God suddenly everybody shh. listen to this story it's a good one it's a love story how you came to Christ when did you come to Christ when did Christ come to you and some of you are sitting right here in these chairs. Some of you was at youth camp. Maybe it was on the phone. Maybe it was behind your desk at work. What brought you to Christ? What is your story? But then there's another story beyond that, and that is, what have you done since then? What are you going to do with it? And look what Paul and these believers did with it. They did something with it. They lived the rest of their life like that story is the most important part of their life. Because it is. Would you bow your heads? how we live really does matter to this community. We ought to be the best drivers. We ought to be the best fathers, the best mothers, best friends. And that's what a truly accepting Christ into your life becomes. It makes you somebody that is good. Good. If you haven't come to Christ, why don't you do that right now? Let this be the day. Let this be the moment. Just invite him in. Jesus, I make you Lord of my life. I 
want this day to be that day. All the things that have led up to this moment in my life have brought me to this climax of accepting you into my life. And I, I thank you for loving me. Thank you for your forgiveness of my sin. Wash me today. Purify me. Come inside of me and live in me. And I pray that you would give me strength for the rest of my life to live for you. In Jesus' name, help me, oh God. Help me to live for you. I want to get to know who you are, what you like, and what you don't like. And I want to accommodate for you living inside of my life for the rest of my life. I want to get to know what you like, and I will do it in Jesus' name. And God, as we have reminisced today, the things that brought each of us to you, I, I know that you've been able to see what's going on in our hearts and minds, and I'm certain that it pleases you, just as it pleased you to hear that story that day from the Apostle Paul. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for loving us in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I just want to give you an opportunity. If today is that day for you, you accepted Christ into your life. I just want to give you the opportunity to say, yeah, John, that was me. I want you to look up at me until my, my eyes catch yours if that was you.